Thanks, Annie, <clears throat> for that welcome. Um, and let's see. Um, so what I thought I would do today is tell you a little bit about my pathway into uh, work as a clinician scientist and um, just showcase one of, actually a, one of our PhD students is um, presenting some of this work from one of our studies next week. And, and I think you'll pick up some of the skills I think you need as a clinician scientist. Um, so, as Annie sort of outlined, I've got a life full of firsts, and that's terrific on one hand, um, but on the other hand, I wish Australia had changed about 50 years earlier than it had, and my parents and my grandparents were the trailblazers, and I could just, you know, loll along behind them and, you know, follow my interests. My son um, was his last day of year 12 uh, yesterday, and um, I've really tried to encourage him down the medicine clinician science pathway, but he's running his own race. He's more interested in engineering, and uh, but he is really interested in science. It's one of his great interests, so I don't feel such a failure. Um, so I was a fortunate medical student. I was the first in my family to complete high school, first to attend university. At the end of high school, I had two great loves, literature and science, um, but I wanted more choices in life and I wanted to escape poverty and I couldn't quite see how literature would get me there, so science won. And I thought, applied science, medicine, let's, you know, um, it, it, was, it was definitely a part of my pathway. Um, at the end of a five-year medical degree, I kind of, people said, oh, what are you interested in? Where are you heading? I said, oh, I'm kind of interested in paediatrics. I'm kind of interested in public health. I'm kind of interested in general practice, but not having a professional, university-educated um, family history, it was difficult for me to take that first step after completing my final year of medicine. So I think, in retrospect, I got a little bit lost after medical school. So be very, um, be very thoughtful, I think, about that first two or three years out from medical school. I think what every clinician scientist needs is to hold on to their love of science and their curiosity, if that sort of led them on the pathway, and, and talk to people about how not to get lost or too lost in those first couple of years out. Um, I probably don't need to tell you this, but I am just amazed at how rapidly the world changes. My son thinks I'm a dinosaur, and he says, in the olden days, Mum, when you were young, um, but, um, but I just can't imagine how much the world is going to change over, the li over your um, professional course of your professional lives. Now, I stepped out of medical school about 28 years ago, and it's quite a while ago, but it's not, a, you know, it's not 50 years ago. Um, and, and we didn't have mobile phones. I stepped into a telephone booth to phone home and tell my family that I'd finished my first um, exam, last exam. We didn't have email, we didn't have the internet, we didn't have the world of personal computers, let alone laptops and, you know, phone banking or anything. So I just cannot imagine over the next 20 or 30 years in your lifetime how much the world will change. And I would much prefer to be a part of shaping that change. Um, and that's what I think one of the, the biggest attractions of, about being a clinician scientist. No matter what your interest, it's, it's shaping that change. And, you know, it's being able to bring the best to the table or the bedside or the bench in terms of providing care and optimising health outcomes for Australians. Um, I kind of talk about five plus three because I, had a, I completed a five-year undergraduate medical degree and then I was, had a great internship, um, a couple of years as a resident, and I was immersed in the world of ideas. I was surrounded by great scientists in, in the university and the hospital, and it was bliss, you know, it was just, there were so many edges of knowledge that you constantly butted against and, um, and, and, and that shaped your day-to-day -day study at university and work in the hospital settings. Um, and then I 
I did. I left the hospitals and I went to general practice. And I don't think it's like this today, but it was a bit of a desert. There were patients who came in with really challenging medical conditions that needed the best management. And it had none of the world of academic medicine. <laughs> you know, disconnected from a university, I couldn't easily have access to journals. Um, disconnected from multidisciplinary care teams. Um, and, and I felt I was, I was, for the first time, in, well, as much as any other time in my life, treating re really sick patients, but in a community setting. So I guess the skill you need, this was the kind of desert I encountered, but if somewhere along your career path you kind of hit a place that's not, that, that doesn't feel like you can thrive, um, to find a way to persevere and, you know, explore um, how to get beyond that and, and keep your career developing in the way that you want it to. And general practice has changed. In those days, I was completing general practice training and trying to, and enrolled in a PhD, and people said, you can't do both, you can't do both. You know, why don't you do one or why don't you do the other? But now people really can do both, and there are a lot of you who are doing medical degrees, some of you doing medical degrees and PhDs. Um, but if you encounter the desert, there is, in the long, immediate long run, uh, life beyond those sorts of spaces that aren't um, thri thriving. Um, so there were first, I accidentally met one of the most important people early in my career. Fiona Stanley is um, a, a, a really, um, she, I think she was Australian of the Year in 2002. And she thought she was stalking me because I was um, in the kids' hospital doing an ED term and she noticed me in the corridor and thought, oh, I've never met an Aboriginal doctor. I wonder if somebody can introduce me. Uh, but she didn't come up and introduce her, herself. I met her a couple of years later. And uh, the skill you need is to find great mentors. You know, Fiona was one of the first and I could put up five different pictures and even now, in my current practice, I still go up back to mentors. And you need to find whatever your field, you need to find the most outstanding settings to work and the most outstanding people. And, you know, maintaining a connection with the academy or with people, you know, um, you, you already know that cl clinical scientists are not, it's not common, um, but it's, it's fulfilling. Um, and you need to find those, find those people and, you know, don't let go of them. A lot of, I speak at a lot of leadership training programs and such a big part of leadership is collaborating and networks. So once you, someone comes into your network and they influence you in one way or another, don't let go of them. Keep building them and retaining them in your professional network and coming back to them. And then you'll get to a stage where, you know, I'm in people's networks and I mentor and I support um, and, and I collaborate with people. It's sort of, you know, a, a different version of the virtuous cycle where we're all here to, you know, to help support and shape careers um, when people are young, but also um, to continue that. But find your mentors and, 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 and don't let go of them. <laughs> um, Health equity has been a big um, motivator and driver. You've got to find, you can't just, you know, you've got to get in touch with what, what, what about whatever you do is your reason for getting out of bed in the morning. You know, put it, fronting up, persevering through the ups and downs of your career. And I also wanted to, you know, I'm as much as, probably more than my science, but as, or at least as much as my science, I'm recognised for changing the system and particularly helping um, the need for more clinician science and science focused on reducing Indigenous health equities. Um, so, but, but that's the thing for me, you know, that for now at least 30 years and, you know, more than that with my years in medical school, really um, know what really pushes you to get out of bed each day and do what you do. So I just want to quickly now profile one of our current research projects and that'll tell you a bit about the skills you need in my particular area. 
Um, I, f I think most of what we what I've done in my career is pretty simple. I, I sent my son off in year 12. I helped him, you know, connect with the labs at the Baker and do lab science. And he said he loved it. He had a pretty good week, but that wasn't the career for him. Um, but most of what we do is pretty simple, and there's always a simple question. You know, this, one of the simple questions when I first um, started was, um, there was a 50% drop in deaths of infants from sudden, from SIDS, sudden infant death syndrome, but the same drop didn't in, in deaths didn't occur for Aboriginal babies. So the simple question was, why hasn't that happened? You know, what's a way to look at the data and understand the underlying risk factors and understand why that didn't happen? Um, another of our projects had a simple question behind it. Um, it was we had um, we had multi generational data on more than for more than ten thousand linked um, records for births in WA with grandparents, mothers, and babies, and we wanted to know if low birth weight was programmed across generations. And we didn't go looking for the gene or the epigenomic changes. We thought if we can't find a space for that impact in the mathematical models. Um, you know, if we can, then we'll go looking um, to understand the basic mechanism, and we didn't. You know, it's it's unique data. So in this study, um, there's been quite a lot of work globally to recognise that adoles adolescent health is a missed opportunity um, for improving global health, and here in Australia for young people as well. So um, the next generation study is one of one of our current studies. A friend rang me up this week. I suppose this is the simple question for these data. He said, my cousin's 30-year-old son just died yesterday. He had a heart attack. So the part of the simple question for this work is, why do young Indigenous, and there's a growing number of non-Indigenous Australians who die young from cardiovascular disease, why do they die? You know, is there something about them as individuals or um, is, is it a broader pattern? Um, and we know that uh, chronic diseases account for 64% of the total disease burden for Indigenous Australians and 70% of the gap, and that cardiovascular disease is pretty prominent. Um, we know that Indigenous Australians, the population pyramid's different. Um, there are a lot of deaths in midlife. Um, in the 30s and 40s, when most Australians are healthy, um, and 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 there's you know the the base is much wider. There's a much larger number of young Indigenous Australians, and some of our work has shown us that um, that 50% of all babies born to Indigenous families are born to young people aged 24 or under. So it changes your perception about um, parenting and. Um, well-being. We helped the AIHW produce a report on the health of Indigenous young people um, and that was released last year but still there were gaps and the report identified some of the gaps, um, particularly data about the onset and progression of chronic diseases, um, the assessment of risk and protective factors and gaps in data for 10 to 14 year olds. Um, so, so one of my PhD students He's looking at the distribution of cardiometabolic risk factors amongst Aboriginal young people, 10 to 24 years of age, and some of the background um, context for those, those changes. So I think um, one of the skills you need as a clinician scientist, I think it's kind of, I feel as an Indigenous Australian, I've got an inbuilt GPS. So maybe my ancestors needed to be able to map um, Map, map the landscape and not get lost. But I have a very good sense of direction and I have a very uh, good sense of how to visualise and, and picture things. Um, and I've certainly needed to use those skills um, in establishing this longitudinal cohort of uh, yeah, Aboriginal young people's health. So, um, so we're recruiting in New South Wales, Central Australia and Western Australia, um, where uh, putting an iPad in young people's hands, we're taking their blood pressure, weight, height, um, and we're pricking their finger and checking their, um, doing point of relatively non-invasive tests of lipids, glucose, and, and we're um, asking for consent for data linkage. Um, we're not 
going in and focusing just on mental health or just on diabetes or just on sexual and reproductive health. This is about young people. So we're trying to look at different aspects of young people's health and wellbeing. And um, I think as a clinician scientist, you've got to be brave and you've got to be persistent. Uh, there aren't many um, studies of young, pe young Aboriginal people's health. So what I always worried about when we got the grant to conduct this study is there's a reason there aren't many of these studies because these guys, they're very savvy and they're, some of them are very cynical and they're not easy to engage with. So we said we'd um, recruit, um, we said we'd recruit over a thousand and I wasn't quite sure if we'd get there. It took a long time, but you can see um, we've got over about 40, we're, recruitment finishes at the end of the year. We've got um, over um, a thousand youth every day the data get updated put my glasses on a thousand over a thousand youth in total now and almost 500 parents um, and you can see we've been more successful in some places than others um, we, most of our young people are recruited through Western Australia and New South Wales is picking up and Central Australia is not so fast um, and we have uh, surveys on everyone, clinical measures on about half of the group, and the detailed um, point of care tests on about a third. So it has been challenging, but we haven't found these young people in clinics and we haven't found them in schools because schools say um, you, this is about education and you can't come here and interfere with kids day to day. Um, so we've really got them in community settings, but we've got, we've actually, I probably undersell it, but this is probably the, the largest and one of the only studies of Aboriginal young people's health. And so straight away, you can start to see, um, you can start to see that we've been more successful at recruiting 10 to 14 year olds than, or 10 to 15 year olds than 16 to 24 year olds. Um, and, and, um, and we've been about as successful recruiting males as females. But in terms of why does an Aboriginal young person die at 30 with a heart attack, um, it starts to become a bit clearer. They, even though they're young, they have a lot of the risk factors, the traditional risk factors for cardiovascular disease um, with 25% overweight, 17% obese. Um, and I find this really interesting, the elevated HbA1c. It doesn't mean they have diabetes, but um, um, they, do, they, do, they are at high risk of diabetes and some of them will in fact have diabetes. And 13% um, having high blood pressure um, and you know 8% having abnormal lipids. So, uh, so and, th and that changes a little bit. You know, if you look at um, the differences in blood pressure, it's about 18% for young males and it's about 9% for young females and 13% overall. So already, um, you know, research never answers all the questions. Actually, this is setting a great platform f and, and raising as many questions as it answers. Um, so you have to you have to be on that pathway, but already it provides a platform for changing or looking at improving the way health services are provided to young Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people and opportunities for prevention. And that's it. Just my acknowledgements. <laughs>